by the time electric cars became a reality, we woke up to a world where China produced 90% of the batteries globally. That is pretty spooky. You think Elon Musk will apply for dual citizenship? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> All right, welcome back to another episode of the Fifth Wall Future World Vodcast, where we bring to you the latest advancement on climate tech and all things climate news related. We've got an exciting day today, Cedric. The boys with the big boss. <laughs> We've got the big boss, Peter. And uh, Peter, why don't you give a quick intro on yourself and why this topic is uh, so top of mind for you? I've been in uh, climate investing business for the past 16 years. And even before that, I was in a, on, on the banking side working in climate. So dear to my heart, both professionally as well as personally, especially with regards to competition and cooperation with China. Awesome. So let us give a quick overview of the article titled, Can the World Make an Electric Car Battery Without China? The TLDR is no. <laughs> <laughs> According to the article, China controls 41% of the world's cobalt mining and the most mining for lithium. You know, Western countries have been more reluctant to put money into countries with unstable governments or poor labor practices. Chinese companies have been able to refine materials at larger volumes and at lower cost than everyone else. This refining also causes pollution and Chinese refineries you know, benefit from less stringent environmental regulations. And lastly, you know, American investors remain wary about putting money into electric vehicles. Traditional cars are still very profitable and the US government EV industry incentives could disappear within the next presidential election cycle. Yeah. So, I mean, let's let's uh, dive into it, Peter. China is running, you know, their whole battery process from start to finish and limiting exports as much as possible. So, I guess, kind of big macro picture first. How does this, you know, I guess, impact us and our our day to day jobs and our investments? I'd like to first talk about how did we get here. You know, you look at the New York Times article and says, "Can the world make an electric car without China?" And when we sent the email around, I said, no, right? I said two letters, no, right? And I think that's the scary part. We didn't get here overnight. This has been a 15 to 20 year process in the making. In the climate 1.0, US tried to compete uh, with China in two main sectors. So one sector was solar and the other sub sector was around batteries. China decided to drop 50 billion of subsidies on solar and during the financial crisis, US companies could not compete with their venture dollars uh, and the DOD loans with that kind of strong political will that China was willing to drop and obviously the labor cost. That was a major loss for the U.S. clean tech industry at that point, how is what's called. As part of kind of the side victim of this was that investments in any climate technology uh, significantly reduced and almost died effectively in the United States in the 2009, 10, 11, 12 years. While China kept racing ahead, with investments, China went into the Congo, to Indonesia, and started effectively buying up the supply chains and shipping those raw materials into China and using its cheap coal to process and refine these materials. U.S. at that point was still preoccupied with recovering the economy, and by the time electric cars became a reality, we woke up to a world where China produced 90% of the batteries globally. And that would not be the scary part. The scary part was they not only produced 90% of batteries, they controlled the supply chains, the mines, the refining, you know, the, the processing, the end products. I mean, it sounds like a, it's almost a race of government subsidies. It, with the IRA present now, does this change anything for the U.S. and, you know, our chances going forward, do you think? So I think subsidies are one part of this that... U.S. and Europe are trying to recreate what China has basically done over the last 10 to 15 years. I think the one thing that U.S. in particular still has is the innovation engine, the universities, the PhDs, the chemists. So we should not lose sight of that, right? Tesla alone has been holding the flag of the U.S. innovation economy around electric cars and around batteries. And so that we have that capability as America to compete on that level. So subsidies help it, but I think the key unlock, having the technology rev up with the use of some of the uh, you know government dollars. Awesome, and so, so going to kind of present time here, Peter, 
battery production wise, that happens in a lot of countries, including the US. The US is trying to build out a lot of battery production, but the like whole supply chain from the mine to the actual construction of the anode and cathode is done almost exclusively in China. Uh, just to be clear, right now the production happens mostly in China and some in Korea, right? Those are the two dominant uh, marketplaces in the world. What I think is happening is that U.S. has realized that in order to produce its auto industry and so, so did Europe, you need to have a domestic battery production because that's about 40% of the value of the car. But to do that, you cannot just wake up one day and decide, okay, I'm going to build manufacturing and to start controlling the supply chains. There are some domestic resources, uh, in, both in Europe and North America, that will need to be developed, and those will require probably some uh, support from the government for, you can call it for climate purposes, for national security pur purposes, to develop these mines. Now, they are not as effective generally and as scale scalable as the mines that you see in South America or in parts of Africa, but if you apply technology to them, they can provide a meaningful resource if they are able to be extracted very efficiently at higher rates and lower cost. So I think that's where the innovation engine can rev up. Uh, we've seen this with uh, the oil and gas industry. You know, Russia, Qatar dominated the gas industry. Saudi Arabia dominates the oil industry. U.S. with a shale resource was a very expensive resource to, to tap into. But the technology enabled this resource to significantly reduce the U.S. In, uh, dependence on, on foreign oil. So I see a similar process playing out in some of these critical materials across nor North and America and, uh, and Europe. It, so, I mean, it sounds like the, the innovation kind of focus has to happen on, you know, more efficient mineral extraction. I guess, are there any opportunities to kind of leapfrog that instead of playing catch up to China with, you know, the, the minerals? So I think you need to go across the board. You need to start with the minerals uh, extraction. You need to find with the, the, how you find the minerals. You need to go to uh, how you refine them. How do you process them? How do you transport them? There's logistics piece to it all the way to the final products. We are all focused on catching up there. I think the scariest part to me is China is winning the battle in, in, in something that has been historically uh, U.S. and European domain, i.e. branded end products, consumer end products. And what do I mean by that? You know, we're obviously uh, aware of the incredible success of Tesla. Um, what I think is not as well known is that BYD is actually, I think, already larger than Tesla in terms of the number of cars sold globally, electric vehicle cars. That's scary. They are now developing a car called Seagull that is going to cost $11,400 and as an electric vehicle with a decent range of north of 200 miles. They will quickly dominate not only the Chinese market, which obviously is very scary to players who have been very active in, in China like Volkswagen or GM, it is more scary to the fact that they will start dominating the other markets such as Southeast Asia, Latin America, where a lot of European and American car brands have historically had strong positions. A lot of their revenue would come from there. Uh, now, are they going to come after the American market? If you speak to the execs and you speak to many people, oh, no, Americans will never buy Chinese cars and Europeans will never buy Chinese cars. Well, guess what? They are already buying Chinese cars in Germany. BYD is selling really well. And number two is that same thing was uh, a prevalent thought in the 90s and early 2000s. People say, oh, people will never buy Japanese cars. People will never buy Korean cars. Uh, well, guess what? Korean cars are now the mainstay of the uh, American system. There's no reason other than some nationalism why people would not be buying Chinese cars. U.S. will have a really hard time uh, protecting one of the key industries in the world, which is the car manufacturing industry. And by the way, that leads into other industries. Batteries are such a cornerstone of this electrification mission that if we lose that battle, we are effectively conceding a significant portion of the economy to Chinese dominance. What does the European Union and the United States need to do, Peter, in order to compete with China? Or are we just never going to be able to compete with China given that they've got, you know, less stringent environmental regulations? You talked about them just using, you know, coal, like cheap, cheap coal to, you know, provide the energy and heat needed for some of these refining processes. How, how are we going to be able to compete here? 
I mean, you can kind of look at the graphic from the article and you see it going from, you know, cobalt mining to refining to cathodes, anodes, to battery cells, to electric cars. But like, where do we compete in there or will we be able to compete at all? So I think there are a couple of solutions that I see. Um, Let's park innovation for now. So there's a lot that can be done on innovation, improving the chemistries, uh, creating alternative sites. One side that I see is there are some critical minerals that we can try to avoid as much as possible. You know, there's a lot of talk about cobalt. Uh, the other one that is creating quite a strain is is Indonesia. There have been articles about how the Indonesian rainforest is suffering mightily because of the nickel nickel mining. So if you can wean of your dependence there, I think there will be a, a reduction of the environmental impact, but B, you can start to break some of these dependencies that exist in the supply chain. Um, that's one side. The se- second side of the equation is, um, you know, what the U.S. is already doing on on uh, the support of domestic mining, the support of domestic production. That's already happening. I cannot envision a stronger government support. Uh, so I think I don't think there's a problem with the European and, and the U.S. government now not supporting this federally. Now it's up to the private capital to actually step up and find the right projects and allocate the capital more efficiently than historically China has been. Because in China, it's all directed from top down. U.S. and Europe still have an advantage where the private capital, the venture capital, the growth capital, the infrastructure finance funds are much more efficient vehicles of capital to allocate this to the best possible projects. So I think we have an advantage and we ought to use it to to our benefit. What is your reaction to, you know, potentially all of these EV industry incentives disappearing within the next, potentially in the next presidential cycle? I think it's extremely negative and not because of the subsidies themselves. You could argue, you know, are the subsidies too high? Are they too low? Right. Should they have been they put in the first place? The problem is the uncertainty created in the system. If I'm an infrastructure financier, if I'm a growth fund, and I need to build this $500 million battery recycling facility, if I'm a hydrogen producer, if I'm a lithium mining facility, how can I fund a project if I don't know where my capital is going to come from and I don't know what my cost of uh, production is and I don't know what my sales price is? It's impossible to run a business. You know, when it's a Muppet show in the Congress and every year they, they change incentives and they go up, down, left, right. China, for one thing, they are very stringent on this. And if there's a support for a certain policy, that support stays there for minimum five years, sometimes a lot longer. So long-termism needs to be part of this. And playing you know, chicken with a debt ceiling and holding hostage some of these important projects, by the way, many of them in red states, is extremely dangerous because it uh, provides uncertainty, not just to the U.S. investors, but to a lot of investors that would love to come here from Korea, from Japan, from Europe, want to deploy capital in North America. So Peter, is, is this where venture capital and private equity dollars are going to be able to come in and really put some weight on the scale? Yes, I think venture capital and growth capital can put some weight on the scale in the first five years of the operation. I'll give you an example. One of the companies we have, Our Next Energy, right? They are the second US-owned gigafactory after Tesla that is being built in North America and Michigan. Huge support from the state, technology advancements that uh, can hopefully double the range of the vehicles and half the cost of batteries for stationary storage. Now the company is entering a stage where they will need to raise billions of dollars uh, from infrastructure financing, from project financing, from the governments, uh, you know, sign major contracts. Venture capital support is important. But, you know, at some point it gets so big that it requires a societal to support. No, definitely, definitely agree there. You mentioned our next energy. We've talked a lot about Ascend Elements um, on the, the vodcast previously, too. What about um, a newer investment from our portfolio, Cyclic uh, Materials? What do they do? Can you, or can you unpack kind of what they do, where they play in this space as well? So what Cyclic does is they actually recycle electric motors and the rare earth materials that are in, in the electric motors, uh, neodymium, praseodymium, uh, uh, dysprosium, and other valuable uh, rare earth metals that are often hard to pronounce. But there is a group of 15 or 16 of them that are extremely important in this, in, in this industry, without which you don't have electric motors for HVAC, you don't have electric motors for cars, you don't have electric motors for wind turbines, 
you don't have hard drives for data centers. You don't have uh, fighter jets. China controls 90 plus percent of the supply here. Yeah, Peter, Peter is from uh, North Carolina, so his southern drawl makes it a little hard to pronounce some of those <laughs> <laughs> elemental names sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Peter, th this article presented a lot of strong points, a lot of good data, um, but there's a little bit of a lack of nuance here um, in the information that was presented as kind of cold, hard facts. Any pushback on any of these points from the article? So I think it paints a dire picture of what's happening. I think it's very correct in the short term, but I would not underestimate the power of American innovation, right? This will turn out to be a big problem because if suddenly you see the automotive car sales disappearing, the battery is being dominated by China. There is a lot happening on the innovation that simply cannot be captured in those charts around how we extract lithium, around how we use novel types of batteries, around how do we produce hydrogen, around new solar technologies that may completely change. It's a very scary static picture. I think the movie hopefully is a bit more positive over the next five to seven years, but it will not be easy because the lock on the supply chain is so hardcore. Do you think, you know, there's any place to be had in investing in Asia, um, you know, the APAC region in general, or do you think this is kind of the, the end of uh, the death of globalism as we knew it? <laughs> These are some heavy topics that we're approaching here. What this article highlights is that no matter how much you fight, these resources are pretty global and we are destined to cooperate, right? I think you cannot just say, oh, this Chilean lithium is mine and this Indonesian nickel is yours, right? It's not the way it's going to work, right? We are pretty interconnected and I, I don't see how there is a complete bifurcation of the economies the way it worked, uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s with uh, the Cold War, right? The resources are so global and it will be impossible to split the economies. So I think at some point there will be some level of cooperation that will be required. Definitely there's going to be an effort to reduce the dependence and make it a more equal relationship because right now China has the upper hand. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a debt of globalization. I... I just don't don't think that would be smart for any of the sides. If you think of the game theory, it doesn't benefit any of the sides. Yikes! That is uh, that is pretty spooky. You think uh, Elon Musk will apply for dual citizenship in that case? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> Peter, thank you so much for joining us today to to talk about this and why we all are here and investing in this space because we do believe that we're going to be able to compete with China. A closing thought on mine is I, I kind of want to compare the story of the semiconductor markets and what has happened between the arms race and semiconductors to what is going to unfold on the battery side. And I'm hopeful that some of the things that we learn are we can take some things from, from that story and apply it to, to this race as well. But uh, big thanks again, Peter, for taking time. Absolutely. It's been great having guests.